in this lecture, we'll continue our discussion on uh, I/O devices. In the previous one, we took a look at keyboard, display, and to some extent on printer. Okay. Printer, we are in fact looking at uh, say something like a line printer, which is which will print at the character level, and then yeah. Uh, dot matrix printer which is at uh, a point level that is at dot level we may say or in fact specifically in the representation one bit will correspond to one dot okay and uh, <coughs> it's like this the cpu or some controller okay if not the cpu if cpu is not directly involved that will send a code to the printer now that code will identify either the character or the pattern for the character because in the case of a dot what you have is in fact uh, something like a, a column of pins okay if for instance you have a 7 by 5 there will be 7 pins 7 pins and these 7 pins will be moved in adjacent positions and then appropriate pattern will be formed for instance if uh, a is to be printed then the first column only this will be activated maybe this or maybe this okay let's say these three are activated in the second column only say this is activated this pin is activated and then in the third column only this is activated in the fourth column only this is activated it's not 7 by 5 it's in fact going more than that and so on so forth okay so like this so now what is uh, needed is this particular pattern whatever it is it's more than 7 by 5 okay uh, oh i forgot <laughs> this thing also is it not at this point uh, let's uh, add these okay now you just take one specific column and you take a specific column if you find two dots printed actually it means from the print head this pin and possibly this pin these two pins have been activated and that's why these have been these dots have been created okay so in other words have with a column of pins and by moving the column over the paper okay, we can print it out so a code that comes from the cpu or a controller will have to identify this pattern in this time sequence whereas in the character oriented printing uh, possibly let's say we were talking about the daisy wheel so the uh, for this one what do you call that on the print head the block for printing that not this okay um, will already be there and in case so says uh, b will have to be printed then B will have to be positioned under a particular, okay. Uh, say <coughs> this is the print wheel, this is the print wheel which has all the things. Say all these have been just shown only for what? All these have been shown just for, uh, for us to see clearly, okay. For instance, A or B or C or D. While printing actually this will have to be reverse form the mirror image form of it right fine now if a has to be printed command must be given so that a will be brought under some position and then a hammer will go and hit now if d must be brought uh, d must be printed the wheel must be rotated in the other direction d must be brought here and then print like that now both these versions one working at character level the other working at the dot level both these version in fact they correspond to the type uh, impact impact type printers that is by making impression through impact by say uh, using a hammer on the uh, wheel or just the pin itself getting activated on the print media that is the paper the impression is created now you also have non-impact type printers 
right. Non impact will be somewhat like uh, the process will be somewhat like what you have in uh, photography, right. There is possibly um, uh, spraying of some chemicals, okay, or uh, let us say depositing some chemicals, depositing of some chemicals on uh, uh, appropriate uh, paper. The paper may have to be coated, right, may be coated or may be an ordinary thing. So, depositing some chemicals or let us say burning, okay, the already coated, burning chemicals which have already been coated, something like that. Now, in all these things, there is no mechanical impact, okay, there is no mechanical impact, but you create a pulse to burn, you create a pulse so that, a pulse so that the, some deposition can be made, okay. Now, like this, you also have the non-impact printers, fine, let us not worry too much about the mechanism by which the printing is done. Now, as far as the interface is concerned, a code comes and then depending on whether it is a character or a dot matrix, whether the impact type or non-impact type the appropriate signals must be generated, okay, to create a pattern, a pattern such as this, all right, good. That is what uh, is there in a print. <coughs> um, now, in the case of non-impact, as you can see, except for the movement of the paper itself, suppose the print is on the paper. Okay, the printing is on the paper, except for the movement of the paper, there is no other movement. Whereas, in this uh, impact type, okay, the wheel will have to be positioned, the print head must be moved and so on. Right? So, whenever there is a mechanical movement involved, it is going to cause some delay. And so, this is going to uh, create some problem, uh, not problem really, it is characteristic of that, it is going to cause some delay. In other words, uh, we will uh, get low speed printing, right. Wherever mechanical movement is less, then we can hope for high speed printing. Now, depending on that, the data rate will vary, okay. Good, that is in short about these uh, printers. Now, let us uh, look at another device which is commonly used these days, what is that namely a mouse, okay, the common device that is used, the mouse which you put on the pad and move it around, what exactly it does. Well, what type of device it is first of all, it is inputting. Okay. The mouse itself will be mechanically moving over the pad and uh, along with uh, in that particular mouse arrangement you also have buttons, okay. you click the appropriate buttons. And then how exactly it is viewed the position of the mouse, actually mouse though it is input on the display the corresponding cursor is there. right? on display, you have the corresponding cursor. So, really one looks at the cursor. So, though it is input device, apart from the uh, program needed for processing the location of the mouse, there is a mechanical position of the mouse on the pad, there must also be a display routine associated with the cursor. right? So, it is in fact some kind of an indirect thing, meaning here the display is in fact the output which is what we are seeing, okay. we use it for monitoring the movement. Now, there are many ways in which uh, <coughs> uh, this particular mouse position can be sensed where exactly it is. Now, by moving a cursor say on icons and clicking the button, now which of the buttons, okay, this is another aspect of it. One is uh, we are using the mouse and positioning it, okay. Actually, we are inputting through the position of that, mechanical position of that, 
Now this is one thing. Another thing is clicking the appropriate buttons. Now you may have more than one button in which case we talk about which button to click. And then sometimes the same button how many times do you click. Okay? Uh, so number of times the buttons are clicked. Now that also is an information. So using the mouse and noting the position and using which button and how many times the buttons are clicked, we are inputting the information all by looking on the display at the cursor which is supposed to correspond to the position of the mouse. All right? Good. Now, one implementation of the mouse would involve somewhat like this. Uh, have a pair of uh, counters, okay? call this as x counter and uh, y counter. Okay? Have a pair of counters and whatever may be the position of the mouse on the pad, okay? let us say this is the initial position. And if the mouse is moved in this direction, okay, arbitrarily let us say, the x counter position will be incremented by say 10, just arbitrary, arbitrarily I am saying 10, incremented. On the other hand, if the mouse is moved in this direction, the x position, uh, x counter contents will be decremented. Similarly, if the mouse is moved in that direction, the y counter contents will be incremented. In this direction, if it is moved, I am assuming equal, uh, equal amount of movement in all the directions, okay? decremented by 10. On the other hand, if the movement is in this direction, then both x and y will be incremented. Now, if you do it at any other angle, it is not going to be equal increment. It will be unequal increment in x and y. Okay? So, by actually, that is why you set the position. When you move the cursor and by monitoring how the x and y counter contents incremented, decremented and by how much, one can actually find out or locate the coordinate that is in fact understanding uh, where exactly the mouse is. Now corresponding to this on the display, the cursor must be moved. Okay? Good. So in other words, apart from this, apart from registering this, the processor or the controller must periodically okay, monitor these counters, periodically monitor the counters. So I just assume x and y counters. So by monitoring this particular counter and knowing what exactly it is, correspondingly on the display the cursor will have to be moved. Okay? And I already said you can have a few different buttons to indicate different uh, this thing um, uh, operations and then also by clicking on the buttons certain number of times. So one click means one thing, two click means something else. Okay? Now these are the things. Now you can see that compared with keyboard, okay, compared with keyboard, mouse is certainly faster. Why? Because in the keyboard for indicating say one particular item, um, let us say close the file. Okay? At least something like C and L will have to be typed. If not C L O S E. Okay, C L may be file. Okay, that may be. Whereas in the, the mouse on the display, we are going to have something. We are going to move the mouse onto some icon, which is indicative of closing the file, and you click the button. So the entry number of entries or the now uh, the mechanical. Um, uh, the other, the time taken to indicate the particular command is going to be less, okay? Because it's going to support the graphical interface. Good. 
So, we can say that it is slightly faster, okay, slightly faster than keyboard and certainly as uh, I said it is such quite useful in the case of uh, interfacing because the graphical okay, uh, <coughs> let us say icons, we can make use of the icons on the display. Good. Um, so, that is about uh, the <coughs> IO devices we have seen. Now, we move on to the next uh, uh, quite important subsystem namely the disks subsystem. Now, the disk okay, system we may call as I O or in general put it under the category of storage. Why? Because in the disk we are generally going to have the files and you can make use of the files as input and similarly create the files for recording the output. So, that way they serve as I O, but essentially the user is not going to directly put it put, put something in the disk, okay? because the disk is quite fast in fact compared with other things other I O things. So, in fact the disk will be totally under the control of uh, the processor directly or indirectly through the disk controller. So, you cannot say that uh, like for instance mouse or keyboard, okay? like mouse or keyboard, disk is not going to be directly used by the user. Okay? So, essentially it is for storage because um, the system is going to be totally under the control of the operating system also. Okay? Now, the main thing about this particular disk is that uh, this uh, particular type of thing is non volatile meaning even if power goes okay even if power goes the information that is stored there the data that is stored there is not a risk it's all the time available okay so that's what it is so that's what happens in case there is any power failure which may be sensed immediately all that are available in semiconductor memory uh, in the uh, usually a few milliseconds will be available because when the ac power fails the dc power does not fail immediately okay that's going to take a few milliseconds and that is plenty of time for storing all that may be lost all the data that may be lost okay because of the semiconductor or whatever that was stored in the semiconductor memory they can all be stored in the disk. So, that in fact is the main function of the power failure trap routine. Okay? Good. Essentially in disk there are two types that is the first one is uh, very flexible and that is just a called the floppy because of the, the size is small generally we talk about diskettes okay the medium is a diskette and the system is the floppy subsystem the second one and in fact it's quite flexible as you, as you would notice the second one is a hard disk system okay. now whether it's a floppy or the hard disk okay essentially what you have is a rotating platter, okay? Let's say a rotating platter, which uh, will be rotated about its center. And this particular rotating platter will be coated with some. Uh, will have been coated with uh, some magnetic material. Okay, coated with some magnetic material. In fact, it is because of this magnetic uh, thing only we are talking about the non volatility, right. That is why with the power uh, failure we do not lose the information. Good. 
Now, this particular material, now in the case of hard disk, for instance, this is a metal or a glass, hmm? in the case of hard disk, that a base, uh, that is we talk about a base uh, platinum material, which may be uh, in the case of hard disk, say glass or uh, um, metal. In the case of floppy disk, it is invariably some uh, plastic uh, okay, stuff, some synthetic one because it will be very flexible, uh, there is a floppy. In either case, we talk of the uh, a coated material. In fact, it is this particular magnetic material which is going to be uh, uh, what do you say as uh, uh, polarized in one or the other direction. Okay? So, in one or the other direction depending on that particular magnetic polarity, we talk about uh, st saving 1 or 0, logical 1 or 0. Okay? Now, the system will essentially consist of a constantly rotating platter and this coating may be on either side. So, we talk about uh, surface. For instance, both the top surface and the bottom surface may have been coated. Okay? They have been coated. And then we also talk about the, the uh, depending on the type of material, we talk about the density also. Okay, we'll uh, see that a little later. Now the rotating platter you have, and then uh, over this there will be a read right head. Okay, usually positioned very close to each other. Okay, very close to that particular surface. In uh, some this thing, it even be touching. Okay, very close. Now, <coughs> in the case of uh, uh, this thing, hard disk. Okay, we can talk of more than one platter stacked. Okay, more than one platter stacked. Whereas in the case of uh, floppy, you al always talk about only one specific plat platter. Okay. Now, this one we can talk about a single side depending on the surface that is coated. Okay. Suppose only one side is coated, then we talk about a single side, or if both sides you have co coating and both sides are used for storing the information by appropriately magnetizing the material okay that is <coughs> that would correspond to writing fine then what is the density of coating which will appropriately support the density of storage okay and of course it will all be linked with the type of material. Now, depending on this, this uh, diskettes will be coming in different, uh, uh, say, uh, it, it will uh, uh, have different capacity. So, we talk about a uh, disk capacity because, for instance, you take a hard disk. Okay. This hard disk will be certainly very rigid. Now, whenever something is very rigid, then it can rotate very fast. Okay, it can rotate very fast. And when it can rotate very fast, then obviously while reading or writing, it can also access the data faster. Okay. On the other hand, if it's a very flexible one, as in the case of a floppy, it's not going to be it cannot rotate very fast and hence the data rate also will be low. Okay? Now, like that, depending on whether you have single or both side coating, depending upon the density of coating which supports the density of uh, uh, this thing storage and also the material, the capacity will be very. Okay? That is uh, in short about this. Now, we will see something more about uh, the disk system. I will give you some more figures also about this. We were talking about the rotating platter. Now, if the platter were rigid, okay, I said 
there are some advantages. Let us just see. Suppose if rigid, then obviously the particular platter can be larger. Okay. Now, depending on this particular one, uh, the size being large or small, obviously this would mean more data can be handled. All right, so that helps. So more data handling is possible. So typically, what is this uh, particular size like? Somewhat like, say, in the range of one inch to ten inches. That's what you have. Okay, that is the normal size. Then, if it's rigid, it also can spin faster. Is it not rigid? If it's flexible, then there would be problem. So it can spin faster. Okay. Now, when it can spin faster, said it would mean higher data rate. Okay higher data rate all right now what is the uh, usual uh, speed okay of rotation it's in the range of say something like 3500 to 5500 rpm okay that is the revolutions or rotations per minute then if it can be rigid then obviously higher density it will be of okay higher density material can have the coating also can be so and obviously more data can be accommodated then also set can have stacks of them that is you can have platers okay stacked one above the other then uh, <coughs> That's what we are talking about is how more platters. It need not be a single one, right? Whereas if it's flexible, you do not know. You cannot uh, accommodate them neatly, right? When you talk about the stacks, usually say it is in the range of 2 to 20 numbers, okay? It is 2 to 20 numbers of these platters may form a disk, uh, generally called a pack also. Okay, good. Now, <coughs> how the data is organized, right? This is these are all uh, somewhat mechanical information. Now let us see. Typically, if you just take one platter, if you just take one platter, then uh, the read or write head will be over the surface. Okay, and it will be moving appropriately let us say this is the center of it around which the whole thing rotates okay so this is just one platter you read or write head will be moving obviously the read or write head is uh, say le let's say read head read head is going to sense the magnetization whether it's of this uh, positive or negative sense it's going to interpret it as one or zero is said and then the read or write head is going to be just somewhat say of this or even smaller in size, which means basically the whole pattern is not being occupied, is it not? So it is going to be confined to one uh, say area, small area and we also said the whole thing is rotating, right? rotating in one direction or the other. So when the read head is placed in one position and when it is rotating, it is obvious that uh, the data can be formed along the circumference, right? Whatever may be the this thing, uh, the whatever may be the radius, right? So that's why you would see that <coughs> the uh, data is organized so that the data will be on what may be called as tracks. Okay, the tracks. For instance, just two tracks have been shown here. Okay, just two tracks on which the data may be stored will be here, uh, shown here. See, for instance, the read head may be here. In which case, this uh, the information, the data on this track is going to be sensed, or the data is going to be written on this track. Now, when the read head is moved, then it's going to be concerning this particular track and so on and so forth. All right, so that is the track. Generally, the number of tracks will be 
of the order of say something like 500 to uh, 2000 per surface, right? Because you can have both uh, uh, on both the sides, 500 to 2000 per surface. Good. So the data is going to be organized around on a track. So that is clear. Then um, it, here is shown just one track, okay? Just one of this track is just shown here. Now you can see that this particular track has been split into what is known as a sector, okay? A sector. Now, why this particular arrangement? <coughs> because spec sector is the smallest unit that can be read or written, meaning the data is going to be stored in a sector, right? And that is the smallest unit. Let us say if we have only 64 bytes per sector, even if you have just two bytes to be stored, it is going to be stored in that sector. Only two bytes should be stored in that. If you want to store 128 bytes, you would be using two sectors in that case, right? So sector is essentially uh, is the smallest unit, okay? Smallest unit that can be read or written. Okay. Okay. So you can see that a plate consists of surfaces, and given a surface, it's going to be split into tracks, and given a track, it's going to be split into sectors. All right. The sector, the number of sectors will be typically of this order: thirty-two to 128 sectors per track. Okay. Now, given a given a surface during formatting of the disk, it will be done. Okay. Whatever may be the track, the number of sectors will be the same. So, though you can see that the smaller the track is going to be denser that's okay okay so if we say 128 sectors per track it is true whether it is the track which is outermost or the innermost okay so that is this the, the these things will be done during formatting okay now take one specific sector okay the data would be stored said of course in the magnetic form right this particular data the format of the data is uh, somewhat like this that is the format in the sector uh, that's first there will be a number meaning to identify which sector because 128 sectors are there okay so first this thing will be the sector number that will be stored that is basically we are looking at what is stored given a sector then there will be a gap now these gaps are necessary because remember this is continuously rotating okay if you don't give a gap sometimes these things uh, uh, the general information and then the data that is stored, they will all get mixed up, right? And then after a gap, the data is stored, okay, uh, using some format or other. And then apart from the data, there will also be generally some error correcting code, okay? Some error correcting code will be there because it is always possible that these things, uh, the data that is stored for some reason gets corrupted and then some error is introduced. So, 
the error correcting code will either just indicate that there is an error or it will help you understand what the error is that is detect the error and correct it also okay sometimes you may be able to correct or at least detection is good enough all right uh, for instance an odd parity even parity is the simplest one right of uh, error correcting code odd parity indicates that the total number of data bits including this will be odd even parity means the total number of say ones including the ones in this code will be even so this is simple okay some code and then after this there is a gap and uh, then the other sector starts that is sector number the same way okay sector number some gap then the data with the error correcting code and then there is a gap that is typically uh, what you have in a sector that is the format in which the data is stored so as i said suppose the data format is such that the data that is stored in a given sector is 40 bytes even if you store less than 40 bytes one full sector will be used okay the rest of them will not be useful for that purpose good okay so now uh, remember as i said that all sectors or uh, rather all tracks have the same number of sectors i just mentioned it right earlier have the same number of sectors okay and also i said sometimes you during formatting you'll be able to adjust that now take one platter and one track and as shown here uh, assume that there are three platters so what i have done is i have just taken on those three platters the same track suppose this particular uh, track is track number 5 huh? then the same track number 5 i have taken on the other two platters also as you can see here right and i also said a read head is always over the surface in fact uh, read in it's also both right huh? read write head generally that's how it is the read write head will be fixed on an arm yeah, in fact my arm in fact is like that okay so you can see that the rotate over the rotating platter there will be a moving arm holding the read right head so that by moving the arm over the different track we can read the information from that respective track now when you have multiple platters obviously it means there will be multiple arms certainly multiple read write heads and there can be a single arm in which case in any in any way okay uh, in any case uh, the same read write head will not be used uh, what will happen if we use then if there is only one read write head it will have to be used here or here or here having the uh, number of uh, the, the multiple platters is not going to be meaningful so if you have uh, n platters it is meaningful to have n read write heads but then all of them will be moving in the same way that is all the read write heads will be synchronized reference to the arm so you can say that if track 5 has been chosen on one platter on one surface similarly track 5 in the other things will also be selected so actually for shown like this for the arrangement shown like this there will be three read write heads okay now if that means basically simultaneously data can be sensed from three tracks on the three okay on the three platters then we talk of a cylinder as you can see okay a cylinder is nothing but the arrangement something like this in which we talk about cylinder consisting of tracks on multiple platters okay cylinder consists of tracks 
on multiple plateaus. So that's what you have there. Now, uh, it's not always necessary that there must be only one read write head. Okay? Why? You can have one read write head here, another one here, another one here, another one here. One can have it. So multiple read write heads, multiple heads are also possible. Okay, so that the reading can be very fast. But even one will do. One will do mainly because this anyway is rotating. So under that particular thing, it will anyway come. Okay. Good. Now let's just see how the data will be accessed. Okay, this generally comes under what we have put it in general as a disk access. Okay, we're talking about this disk access here, here. Now we know that the disk access will consist of what? Reading data from a sector, okay, which is part of the track like this, and the tracks may be spread over different platters, and the read right here itself is position over an arm which will move over the appropriate track. So given this picture, you can easily list all that is involved in reading from a disk. While talking about the I/O throughput, I was mentioning about this uh, disk access earlier, remember? Now why is it that uh, we have to pay some attention to this? How many disk accesses per second? No, this is a very important uh, figure that is needed. Why? Because different times are involved. Okay, first, as uh, we have seen earlier, the arm must be positioned over the track. Is it not? So position the arm over the desired track. Now this is the first step. Okay. Now there is this particular one is called the seek time, okay, seek time. Now on an average the seek time is something like uh, uh, say 10 to 20 milliseconds, okay, and then average takes 20 milliseconds, 10 to 20 milliseconds. So the arm must be moved. Right? We do not know where the uh, earlier position was. Suppose the position were here, it has to move only this much. On the other hand, if it were here, it had to move more. So that's why we talk about an average thing. Okay, that is a seek time. Then, what? The desired sector must come under the read head, is it not? Because we have only talked about the track. So we may read from here or from here or from here or, or from all that is a different thing. Okay. So the desired sector must be rotated and brought under the read write head. So desired sector to rotate uh, under the read write head. Okay, so that must come there. Now, this, in fact, the time involved in this is called rotational latency, or uh, okay, rotational latency or delay. Okay, rotational latency or the delay. Now. Typically, the figures uh, for this particular one, uh, yes, if you understand, if you uh, imagine only one read write head, you can see that it is the time taken for half the rotation, is it not? That is the time on an average, we are talking about an average, half the rotation and that would depend on the speed, that is the RPM. So typically, from that particular thing, you can work it out. This will come to something like something 5 to 8 milliseconds. Okay. Now, this is 
the second time that is involved. Then what? Third one. Ah, in this uh, note that smaller the disk, faster it will be, right? That is another thing. So, the size of the disk, the RPM at which it rotates, all these things matter, right? Good. Then we have to transfer this data block. We are talking about uh, the block of data from the sector now. So, the time for transfer. Okay. So, transfer data block from the sector. That is the actual reading from the uh, medium from the sector. Now, typically, uh, this of course, depends on uh, the technology. Now, typically, we may say now in present days or maybe I may be a little giving a little conservative figure, you can say it is something like 2 to 4 megabytes per second. Okay, this is the rate at which the data is transferred. Now, obviously, the size of the data, the rotation speed, the recording density, all these things will play some role in this particular one, right. Then fourth, what say all these things are controlled by the disk controller, is it not? Now, the disk controller will add its own overheads. So, we generally call it as the time taken by the disk controller, because the disk controller will initiate, it will bring in, uh, generally we talk about the overheads introduced by the controller. And in this process, any other wait time, why? It is possible that uh, the processor has indicated that it wants disk to be accessed, but then the particular disk pack may be busy with some other process, say in the case of multiple processor, or it is halfway through doing something else, okay, any other wait time. So, in fact, one has to take all these things into account and then only talk about an average disk access time, okay, that will give an idea. Now, having talked about these different types of uh, devices, it is time that we take a look at the data rate, which is quite uh, useful for us. So, we took a look at keyboard, mouse and so on. See, keyboard transfers data at 0.01, uh, typically, okay, 0.01 kilobytes per second. Mouse, slightly better, 0.02. Line printer that is character oriented, huh? that is 1 kilobyte per second. Laser printer quite fast because non impact generally is 100 <coughs> kilobytes per second. If you take the disk or a Mac tape, typically it is 2000 kilobyte per second, and display specifically graphics display, okay, it is going to be. 30,000 kilobytes per second. Of course, these things will depend on the resolution and what not, fine. So, you can see that the wide range from 0 0.01 kilobytes per second through to 30,000 kilobytes per second. You can just see the diversity. So, that is why uh, we have, we talk about a keyboard controller which will be different, mouse controller will be different, printer controller will be different because the mechanism also, right, in which this accepts. From CPU point of view, it is just one throwing one code. Say, in the case of keyboard, it will accept a code. In the case of graphic display, it will throw out a code, finish, there its job is over. But that specific controller, keyboard controller or display controller will have to take care of not only the data rate, but also the mechanism by which it has to either accept a code and uh, or display it, okay. So, we talk about the diverse things here. So, in this series so far, we have taken a look at the CPU, memory and I O, right. Now, the one interconnecting these, that is the bus and a few other things, which we will consider in the next part, we just call it bus, miscellaneous, etcetera.